This is Boba for Boba Fett. This is Tofu. How amazing these dog names. Um, and this is their roadmap to success. Now, Boba was very fearful of me. So on the video above, he wouldn't even come near me. Now he's climbing up on top of me. Um, and so this is a great illustration of how dogs can change their behavior with a little positive reinforcement and the right approach using some dog psychology. So I spent a lot of time in this session not petting him, not looking at him, not engaging with him. I don't want to get too much over into that stuff because I encapsulated a lot of it in that video above, but it took time for him to feel comfortable enough for me to reach over and pet him without him freaking out. Even that put his ears back a little bit so he's a little insecure. Now, one of the things the guardians I uh, was concerned about was he's reactive. Both of them are reactive to other dogs on walks. Now, I think for him, it's an insecurity. For her, it could also be an insecurity as well. But we wanna, uh, uh, I always talk about recreating situations, helping the dog practice the behavior that we want. Um, but for him, we really wanna get him in puppy school so he can learn how to interact with other people um, and other dogs. In puppy school, there will be mostly dogs and it's a great distraction, but there are also people there for him to interact with just a little bit as well. But for the most part, what I would do is just ask people to ignore him. Now, because he's reactive to people on walks and dogs, um, we w I'd like the guardians to identify what his warning signs are. So a lot of dogs, the first thing they do is they stare. They usually lower their head and stare. A lot of times their ears go back, his ears go back. A lot of times they put their tail up, they start pulling their lips back, kind of an elvis or uh, licking their lips, trying to show their teeth a little bit as a warning. Um, sometimes they will breathe really heavy, he did, or they will hold their breath, they'll be very stiff, they'll move away, they're really uh, twitchy. Um, those are signs that the dog is uncomfortable. And so one of the things I'd like the guardian to do is have the guardian's uh, uh, partner go out with them on a walk together. And the partner should stay about 10 or 15 paces behind and a little bit of an angle. And so if Boba's here and I'm the guardian, we have the other guardian back there and we have people walking towards us. So the camera view is this direction. So we can see the handler, that dog, and what we're encountering. And the idea for this is do this on a walk and keep the camera sideways. And then just go for like a walk where you're gonna be around a couple other people and a couple other dogs. And the idea is so you can see what his warning signs are. So if you're a little bit, if you're right behind, you're gonna miss a lot of it. So you wanna be a little bit diagonal. Uh, right across would be even better, but you don't get as much of a forward angle. And the idea, what we're looking for is to start to see when you're, somebody's approaching, you see Boba's tail goes up, his breathing starts getting accelerated, his ears come up and he starts licking his lips. Those are his indicators that I'm uncomfortable. And eventually then he starts barking and lunging because the people that he's with, his handler, are not getting him out of trouble. So the idea is we need him, we're gonna work on things, we talked in this session about a lot of things to build up his self-esteem and confidence and flip the leader-follower dynamic. But we also need him to be, uh, his guardians to understand how to read his body language and to get him out of trouble before he feels like that he needs to handle it on his own. So, if you, uh, so I would do this a couple walks and then watch it on your big screen TV and pause it and play it in slow motion right as you're about to meet these people. The whole point of this situation is to get the dog out of the situation before they become what we call above threshold. Above threshold is when they're barking, reacting, or lunging. Um, it's basically they're hysterical. They're not going to listen to you at that point. You're not going to reason with them. Um, and the whole and once you get to that point, distance is your friend. Distance is your friend all the time. But in this case, you just have to move the dog away. You might have to pull on the leash, which I don't like to do. But you just have to do what you have to do to get the dog away. Sometimes you have to go around a building, around something, and block its sight, and let the thing pass. But in the future, what we want to do is, as we're walking towards the thing, as we start recognizing, oh, there's somebody coming towards us. Now I look at my dog. And when my dog starts offering me the warning signs that I know that precede him lunging, then maybe we take a deviation, we walk down some sidewalk here to walk to Soy's door, and uh, we let that other dog pass, or we you know, kind of take a walk into somebody's yard, get increase the space, so that for dogs, front facing is confrontational, and the way our sidewalks are, are set up in our city grids, we're walking directly towards the other dog. For his case, he's insecure about that, and he's gonna get more and more nervous the closer we get. And as humans, we think, we're just gonna pass that dog. We're not even gonna to talk to that dog. He's like, you're leading me to doom. So what you need to do is get him out of trouble beforehand. Now, I just spent some time going over a focus exercise with the guardian. She has a little bit of a uh, physical injury that is making it a little bit difficult for her to do the exercise. If you forget how to do it, if I haven't posted above, please remind me and I will include a link on how to do the focus exercise. The focus exercise is a great way to redirect the dog's attention away. So when I do the focus exercise, usually I first do it in the house to up to 15 seconds in the house within a week. Then I start doing it outside when there's no dogs around. And eventually I do it when we're on walks and there's no dogs around. And the dog's, let's say, walking here. 
and I just say focus, the dog is walking and looks up at me. I raise the treat to my nose and I go like this as we're walking and then put it in the dog's mouth. So you can condition your dog or train your dog to look up away from something. So if you are walking the promenade or the boardwalk or somewhere where you don't have an option to go away, well, if you condition your dog to look up at me, and instead of staring at the other dog, you go like this, and that's why we make the second movement of the treat up to 15 seconds. So I was walking, looking at us as we're going by, and by the time we pop the treat in the mouth, the other dog is passing us. We pop the treat in the dog's mouth, and now it's ready to bark and lunge, but the other person, dog is already past us. So we get the dog out of trouble before it can get itself in trouble. Now we also want to do some maintenance. Don't take him to places there's going to be a lot of people and dogs. He's not ready for it right now. And the more he practices that behavior, the better at it he's going to get. So what we want to do is find uh, some situations where we can get him around other dogs in an easy capacity so he can start practicing being calm around other dogs. Now, I'd like the guardian to take him to puppy school. Um, dog's true personality doesn't kick in until they're nine months, and he's only four months old. So we have five months left to modify his behavior. Puppy school will help with that a lot. And if the puppy school you want to find, make sure it's not too big. They should separate the dogs by size. You don't want to have him with chihuahuas or little tiny dogs. And we don't want it to be too many dogs are overwhelming. And if he wants to, and I'm guessing the first week or two, he's probably going to sit on the side of the class and bark when other dogs come near him or snap it if they try to come near him. You want to find a puppy school that's going to understand what he's going through and is going to help him work through that. Let him stay on the side. Don't encourage him. Don't force him. Don't, and if the other dogs get too close, try to move him away. We have a little play gate here set up around the TV to keep the dog away from him. In our puppy classes, we actually set one of those up where we can put dogs like uh, Boba in there so he can observe the other dogs and they can't get to him. We want him to practice being calm around those dogs and get to the point where he wants to go play with those other dogs who what they're doing looks fun. Now he'll, he'll transition from, first I'm gonna snip at anybody that comes near me, then I'm gonna to walk towards them and run away. And then eventually he starts kind of walking around, following them, but a little bit of a distance, then eventually he'll start getting in the fray. So we wanna find it and make sure that the class that you use, the puppy class, should be positive reinforcement and force free. They're trying to force your dog to do anything that is inappropriate. It's gonna make the dog's fear validated and makes it much stronger. So whenever possible, if he wants to move away from things, let him do it unless it's, it's not safe to do so. Um, and the more that he sees that you're getting him out of trouble or letting him move himself away, dogs don't have to engage the fight mode. The guardian was a little bit frustrated. She was like, I don't understand why he's doing this, why he's, he's lunging at the other dogs. Dogs have a fight or flight response. They're gonna do one of two things when they're confronted. They're gonna run away from it or run and attack it if they don't know how to deal with it. And the leash prevents us from being the dog being able to run away and it only leaves them in the attack mode. And the more that he does that, the more he's practicing doing that, the more he will continue to do that. That's why you want to, it's very important, really important, I can't underscore how important this is, to create stage scenarios where he can practice being calm around other dogs and people. And it might be where they're 50 feet away. That's okay. Eventually it'll be 50, uh, 49 feet, 48, 47. Now, uh, we can also set up a follow-up session to do what I call bat training or behavior adjustment training, where I would have somebody else come around with a dog where we can control that dog and provide him with a distraction and help him practice not reacting to that other dog. I'm hoping that the puppy class and the things we went over today will take care of those things we won't need to, but he's gonna be a very big dog and as reactive as he is and as closely populated as Marina Del Rey is, I would strongly, if you're at six months and he's still doing this, call us up so we can set up a bat behavior one hour training session. It's a lot cheaper than this one where we specifically focus on that and show you how to do it so you can start creating these stage setups and help him practice being calm and polite around other dogs and people as opposed to lunging and barking because eventually he will bite. Uh, as, okay, so exercise is something else we talked about. Um, now we're in an apartment, we don't have a lot of room. He liked chasing the laser, so I would get one of the lasers and do a little bit of a circuit. We're having to run back and forth here and then that way, kind of a T motion and do it as much, you know, come, on, come up with a routine and then that way you can count back and forth and down the hallway and that's one. And then maybe he needs 23 of those. Another one is you can Google scent games, S-C-E-N-T, um, and it, he has to use his nose to find treats that are hidden in the apartment. Another great one is fetch. If he likes to play fetch, you can play fetch, throw the ball over there. And that's a wonderful one. I like pursuit games, things where the dog's really moving forward. That's gonna help drain the energy much more efficiently. Another one that you can use, I, would, I normally don't, this is the first time I've ever recommended getting a retractable leash, but I would get a heavy duty retractable leash where in an apartment complex, go to the stairs, 
Right now he's reactive around other people. So if we find a place like the stairs where most people are gonna take the elevator, that's California, some people will probably take the stairs. But basically the idea is go there when there's nobody there, touch his nose with a tree, make sure you do this again with an empty stomach like I talked about, throw it to the bottom of the stairs when he goes and licks it up, come up with a funny word that means to go down. Call it, you know, lobby or whatever. Try to come up with a word that's funnier than that. And then call him back up to you and give him another treat that means to go up like penthouse. And the retractable leash allows you to have him on a leash, but he can has the freedom to go up and down. First time you do this again, do it with an empty stomach and do keep on throwing those and use the high value training treats, the chicken liver or something good that he really likes. Let him leave with you. Uh, and do as many down ups until he says, I'm not coming up and he just plops down. Count the number of down ups and then you know what his maximum number is. I'm guessing it's probably, probably close to 50. But after you get to the point where it's 50, then maybe three times a day we get him 20 up downs. And then we supplement that by two or three times a day we do a laser game, and then one or two times we do the set games, and we go for two 20 minute walks. So now we're getting him exercise about every two, three, or four hours, and I recommend starting an exercise journal. If you start that journal, you can write down the times. What I usually do is write the dogs, uh, the day at the top of a new piece of paper, each dog's name is Boba and Tofu, write down the time, 8, 15, 15 minute walk. Uh, and again, I would walk them separately just so you, I know it's not convenient, but it's gonna make it easier for you to manage him. Um, and then, uh, then before you go to work, you did this many up downs and then you fed him. And you write down the time and how many up downs, the time and how many laser circuits, the time and how long the walk was, how many set games or whatever it is. And then if he has a barking outburst or he starts chewing the wrong things or whatever, just write down the time and that stuff as well. And then at the end of the day, give each dog a letter grade, A through F. The next day, add an extra game of fetch or an extra up-down, uh, or a couple more up-down repetitions, or what it is. Play around with the elements until eventually you get to the point where you're like, wow, that was like an A-plus day for Boba. Now we know how much exercise we need to get him to put him in a position to succeed. Um, it's really gonna help amplify his unwanted behaviors, and taking that energy off is gonna make it easier for you to fix those behaviors. And so, and again, a lot of these things I talked about are a lot faster than taking them out for a walk. The last thing uh, that I would highly recommend if you can is doing the rollerblading and having him pull you. But again, I don't think that he should probably be doing that until he's at least a year. I would definitely want your vet to uh, sign off on that. Most vets, because the bones and joints and everything is so, are so valuable when they're growing, you don't want to do that. So it might not be something that you do until at, he's after a year. But if you decide after a year you want to do it, let me know. I'm happy to come by and show you how to do it. It's a lot of fun. I call it dog skiing. Okay, um, let's not do that on camera. Um, all right, so what else did we talk about? We talked about rules and structure. The dogs really not right now have no rules and they have no motivation to listen to their guardians because they get petted on demand. So uh, for the rules, I suggested not being allowed in the furniture and I think the guardian is gonna have a difficulty with it. I'm, I'm getting a feeling that she's not going to enforce that rule. That's okay, it'll make the other ones a little bit more important. Um, I would like to see you, if you're not gonna make that rule, then make it at least an ask. They have to sit before you invite them up on the furniture. If they don't, they have to get down. Or if they're up here and they start, she starts growling at him, well, she's mom, so she probably is appropriate. But if he starts barking at somebody outside, then he has to get down. This is a privilege for good behavior, and it's with the human's invitation only. Um, and I would do the same thing for the bed. And so that way the dogs see I have to ask the human for permission, and she's sharing her stuff with us because she's so awesome and she's so generous, but it makes them think about themselves as being more of a follower. These dogs both are not going to be able to get fixed until they identify the humans as being in the authority figure position, and dogs identify leaders as the ones who are enforcing rules and boundaries. Petting and all the rest of the stuff is great, and that's an important part of the dynamic as well. But telling the dog it can't do things and being consistent is important. Remember, dogs flow through consistency, repetition, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog, and it has to be repeated consistently. So, Salute. And so, remember, always give the treat, say the command word after the treat goes in their nose. Salute. Uh, or salute, I should say. Um, okay, um, so uh, some of the rules would be not being allowed on the furniture, maybe the garden's gonna do that, or furniture with permission. Not being allowed on the carpet when the humans are eating. I forgot, just realized I haven't shown you how to do that, so I'm gonna show you how to do that after we film this video. When, they're, when the humans are cooking food, the dog should not be allowed off the carpet. That way the kitchen area is off limits. For dogs to be within seven feet of anyone that has a high value items way for challenging those things. So um, when we're feeding, that's gonna be another way to add structure is the humans who are, who, human who's feeding is gonna eat something first. Doesn't have to be a real meal, five bites of a chip or cracker or whatever it is will work. Then we're gonna give mom permission to eat. When mom is eating, Boba is not allowed to be within seven feet of her, maybe not allowed in the wood. And so she sees the humans have her back 
and that makes her feel confident and also demonstrates the leadership authority of the human. Then when she gets done, she walks onto the carpet and we invite Boba over. And when Boba comes and eats, we use passive training to say a command word, I forgot you should get a command word too. So maybe her word is sushi and his word is pasta or whatever it is. Um, and so we get to the point where we can actually just say pasta and that means Boba gets to go and eat. And we can sit here watching the baseball game and he's waiting, pasta, and he runs over there. Um, let me see, uh, dogs have to sit before we let them out the door. Go to the door and say sit. If you don't sit, walk away, sit down, wait for one minute, then go back and tell the dog again to sit. And keep on doing this in double the length of time. One minute, two minute, four minute, eight minute. And as soon as you go to say sit, the dog sits, boom, the door opens and we go outside. But make sure the human goes through the door first. Whoever goes is in front is perceived to be the leader. For dogs on the walks, make sure they don't walk in front of you. If you have a dog that's walking away in front of you, it's guaranteed gonna be reactive to the people you encounter, especially these two dogs. So they need to walk next to you. Uh, I wouldn't use a, a prong collar, choke chain, or shot collar. I don't believe in those. That's force and it's punishment based. If you want to set up a session where we teach them how to walk with a loose leash, let me know. Uh, but make sure that you're not letting them walk in front of you. That's going to exasperate your problem. Um, let me see. And exercising them before you go for a walk is always a great way to do it, especially for dogs that are insecure like this. You take off that top level of energy. They're going to be a lot easier for them to kind of understand things. Um, all right, let me see, what else? We also went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose, right now these dogs tell the humans what to do, and the humans do it, and that gives the dogs the impression that I'm in charge of the humans, not peers, I have more authority than the humans. But guess what, the humans don't listen to me. When I tell them, hey, that person looks dangerous, don't walk towards them, they walk me right up there to them. So if my humans don't listen to me, that stresses me out as a dog, that in uh, incorporates the stress hormone in my blood, which now makes it a physical manifestation, as well as a psychological manifestation. And it makes it harder and harder for the dogs to not panic when they're in situations they don't have to prepare for. So that's why, again, going back to the leader follower dynamics, it's so important the dogs see the humans as leaders. So basically, uh, a great way to do that is for petting with a purpose, is you just, if the dog wants some attention, comes up and nudges you, it's telling you what to do. Instead of doing it, we tell the dog to do something for us first. Sit or lay down. Pretty easy, the dog's already sitting here, ask him to sit over here. As soon as it sits, we pet it under its chin and say sit and just the word sit, nothing else. And then at that point, you can pet the dog for 24 hours straight. The dog has to do something first to pay for it. After a while, what will happen, the dog will come and sit in front of you to prepay for attention. Look, I'm sitting, could you crash me behind this ear, please? Now we're rewarding them for desired action and behaviors and they're changing their mindset from telling the human what to do to asking the human. That's a follower's position. So um, after a while, when they get to the part where they're starting to prepay, make sure you do recognize that. Otherwise, they'll go back to nudging you or jumping up or you're barking at you for attention. Now, when he does his demand barking, ignore him. Don't look at him. Any look or dirty or scold or anything like that is validating, and that's what he's trying to do is get your attention. The best thing you do is ignore him completely. Sometimes you have to take him for a walk or something if you're going to get in trouble with the neighbors, but the more that you give in, the more he's going to continue doing that. So you really want to nip that in the bud early. And the demand barking comes from because I can tell you what to do and you do it. And if you don't, I'm going to get pissed and I'm going to yell at you for doing it, not doing it. So that's why petting with a purpose is so important. Now, I use a watchword of paycheck for this. So if I'm here petting the dog and uh, Zach comes in the room and sees that I'm petting the dog and standing, Zach says, paycheck. That means I would stop petting immediately. I don't argue with him because that tells the dog it's okay to have a different opinion. I immediately stop petting him. I ask the dog to sit. When it sits, I pet it on his chin and say, sit. Then I tell Zach, hey, Zach, the dog stood up when you closed the door and I continued petting and that's okay. But it just helps you because we won't realize how often we pet without a purpose. Um, and uh, the other flip side of that is what I call passive training. Passive training is waiting for the dog to voluntarily offer you the behavior organically without any influence. So if, to uh, if Bobo was having to get up and walk over here towards me, I would just pet him and say, come. I didn't ask him to come. For her, she doesn't like to come unless she gets a treat or reward. She needs motivation. Well, if we stop petting her ad nauseum, and every time she comes to us, she gets petted and hears the word come and nothing else. Not good come, not her name come, just the word come. Well then, next time I hear come, I'm more likely to come because I like the affection that I got for that. And I don't get that affection for free anymore. I have to earn it. And the more that you make her earn it, the better her uh, leader follower dynamic is going to be uh, developed. And the less stress that she's going to feel, the less she, she's going to feel like she needs to protect you from the outside world. Petting with a purpose and passive training. If you get in the habit of both of those things, every time you pet your dog, it becomes a micro training session that will increase the dog's uh, respect for you as an authority figure and help you practice basic obedience. 
Now, I also went over a focus exercise like I talked about. If you forget about that, message me and I can share a link with you. I also went through uh, basic commands with boba. Sit, lay down, sit up, which I call an up, and then stand. Now, if you forget how to do those, let me know, but I'd like you to practice those. I'd like you to have, so there's four commands. So I'd like you to have, each time you do this, I want you to have uh, 20 of those treats in your hand. So you're gonna do each command once and you're gonna do the whole circuit five times. Don't do it just right here though. Do it sometimes sitting there, sometimes sitting over there, in the hallway, in the bedroom, in the bathroom, all over the place. Dogs don't generalize well. Do it in the hallway, outside, when nobody's there. Remember, always keep that tree within an inch of the dog's nose. If you're trying to do the down and you go this far, go back to the dog's nose. And, and the guardian, when she was trying to do that, she kept on going up above. Make sure you don't go, just go to the nose and stop at that point. And when, you go, when you're trying to get them to go down, just go, now the guardian also pulled away and that creates a pulling and a going up. So you want to go vertically straight down. Vertically, I would see a thing that's going up, but vertical is up or down. Um, so go straight down. And then with, if he's not, if he's looking at me, he's not going, sometimes I go zigzag from one side to the other and they track it. Sometimes that gets him to lay down. Sometimes I push it on the floor towards them or pull it away. Sometimes that gets him to lay down. And a great way to do this, if they have difficulty with the down, is just use passive training. Every dog kind of comes and lays down next to you, put it say crash or chill, whichever word you want to use. And again, come up with fun command words. I'd like to see the guardians go to YouTube, find positive dog trainers. All these dog trainers want a TV show. So they'll show you on YouTube how to teach your dog to roll over, play dead, fetch you a beer out of the refrigerator for Zach, or whatever it is. So now you can actually have the dogs doing things that makes them feel good about themselves. They want to please us. We usually just do a really poor job of pleasing them, which means we get a dog that barks and lunges at people or leaves a headless possum's body on our bed, which we don't really want either one of those. Um, okay. So uh, let me see, uh, sit down, up and stand. Uh, puppy class is gonna teach you a lot of basic obedience, but again, make sure the class is not too big, uh, is separated by breed size, and just say, look, we didn't get him a lot of socialization. He is fearful of new dogs and people, so he's probably gonna bark at the side of the class. How do you guys handle that? Ask ahead of time so you don't sign up and wait for a class and then find out that they're here. Some puppy classes will just kick you out. That's not a very good puppy class. We don't do that. We separate the dogs. You might want to bring this puppy play gate if it's a big room and he's like that. Set it up in the corner and just put him behind the play gate. During, and you want to, oh, uh, I'm glad I remember this. The most important thing for a puppy socialization class is that they have socialization time, which is time for the puppies to play around with each other. Puppy, he will learn more in an hour of playing with other puppies than he will with a week of being around humans. So our classes are four weeks long. A lot of times they're six or eight weeks or whatever it is. Uh, just make sure it's uh, positive reinforcement and make sure it has socialization time. And again, if he doesn't want to deal with the other dogs, bring your, your gate, set it up in the corner, let him observe for a class or two. When he's kind of pawing at it and wants to go out, then what I do is I push one of the sides open so he can actually go out of the gate, but I don't tell him how to do it. Let him figure out how to do it on his own. And once he comes out, then he can run back away if he needs to. Don't let the other dogs go back there. So he has a safe place to go. Kind of like the video I talked about above, letting him practice approaching and then moving away whenever it becomes too overwhelming for him. He needs to feel empowered. The more we force him by blocking him from running away with a leash or putting him in situations he's not prepared for, the more he panics and, and lashes out and that's practicing the behavior we don't want. Uh, let me see, I talked about using carrots. He's a chewer. Um, baby carrots, uh, I like to give dogs at first and when they start teething, I, start, I transition the carrots in the freezer. Remember, if he's licking something, he's getting it soft to, as a precursor to chewing it. So if he starts licking, laying down the floor licking that, what I do is go to the kitchen, uh, go to the freezer, grab about five or six baby carrots, rinse the hard frost out of the freezer, rinse the hard frost out of them, wrap on the floor over here. He's gonna turn this way, drop the treats for about six inches off the floor. Remember, a dog's eyes are attracted to movement. And he's gonna get up and come over here and lay down and chew these carrots. When he gets done chewing the carrots, he's looking here. He's not looking at the thing he was trying to soften up to chew on. He already got his chew time in, so he's happy to walk away and he looks for another adventure. So uh, the carrots can be really uh, very effective. Also, anytime he touches you with his teeth, I watched him mouthing on one of his guardians. She didn't disagree. Well, if he thinks he can mouth the guardians here, he thinks he can guard, mouth any human, but he's insecure. He's at Starbucks somewhere and he's pretty chill. Somebody's holding their hand down. He comes over, he like licks it and they think he's a cute puppy, and then all of a sudden he, he kind of mouths it with a little bit of teeth and they freak out and kick him, he might bite them back and it very quickly can transition to a wrong situation. So he needs to understand that if I just touch any human with my teeth, they cry like, ah! and then freeze. Now for the jumping, every time your dog jumps up on you, any response from you is the dog's trying to get your attention or get you to do something. 
If you shove them off, that's a response. So what we teach in our class, as soon as the dog jumps up on you, cross your arms and look up and freeze. If you're on the couch, lean back into the couch. What you're saying is, I'm turning, I call this light switch off. We're disengaging. As soon as you jumped up on me, I lost all interest. And you wait and become boring. And as soon as the dog jumps down, then you pet the dog and say, off. So again, you're putting in context, getting off of the human is our desired trait. As soon as I jump up on them, they lose all interest in me. As soon as I sit down, they're all over me. As soon as I lay down, they're all over me. As soon as I come to them, they're all over me. Now we're teaching the dogs what they can do to make us happy instead of the things that we don't want them to do. Remember, any attention from us is validating. And most of us train our dogs to misbehave because they steal the remote control or they chew on the power cord or they jump on the counter. We immediately are on it. They come and sit in front of us, we ignore them. That's why petting with a purpose and passive training are so, so powerful. The biggest ROI you will get. We have two marketing geniuses here in this house so I have, and they will appreciate and understand the ROI impact. Um, let me see, is there anything else I'm forgetting? Um. I covered a lot. Now, if I, if I didn't cover something in this video that we talked about, I, I, you have my personal cell phone number. I want you to program that in your phone. Make sure you put down doggone problems as a company name because I have this effect on all women. You will forget my name as soon as I walk out the door. And a month from now, you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta ask that guy, what was that guy's name? Search for dog and I'll always come up. I'm always at your speed dial. I don't charge for phone calls. I want you to call me or text me. The best way to reach me is text me. Text me a picture of the dogs. And David, I forgot a quick question. What do we do if they jump on the counters? What if they do in this situation? I'll get back to you. I don't care if it's literally, I, I am not kidding, seven years after the session. I have helped people years after the session. I don't remember them or their dog. I have to go look at my notes, but I'm able to help with them. All the techniques I use are the standard. It's positive reinforcement across the board. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. So uh, let me see. Somebody like a treat? Look at that. Come. This is one of the cutest dog puppies I've worked with in a while. Sit. This is Boba. This is his mother, Tofu, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. 